Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. Our topic today is the recent wave of retirement plan lawsuits that have been brought against a number of higher education institutions over the past few weeks. Uh, these lawsuits have generally alleged that retirement plan fiduciaries breached their ERISA fiduciary duties with respect to the administration of these plans, resulting in considerable losses for plan participants. My name is John Godso. I'm an employee benefits attorney at Bond, Schenck and King. I'm joined today by my partners, um, Michelle Heffernan and Rob Patterson. Uh, we are all in the Buffalo office of Bond, Schenck and King, and uh, we're pleased to be here today uh, to update you on these developments with respect to these retirement plan cases. Uh, first, a few housekeeping matters. Uh, the webinar today is scheduled for about an hour. There's going to be an opportunity for a Q&A period at the end. To submit a question, use the chat box in the GoToWebinar panel that you have on your computer screen in front of you. Uh, we'll wait till the end to answer questions, but we encourage you to submit them as they may arise during the course of the presentation. Um, there's also a link to the PowerPoint and slides that we have for you today on that panel. Um, so why don't we get started? Um, unless you've been on vacation for the past three weeks or so, uh, you've undoubtedly seen the national headlines regarding these wave uh, of lawsuits. Uh, we've been keeping track of them diligently, and I'm sure you have as well, and probably has generated some, some con um, conversation on your part uh, about what to do. Um, you can see here that there are a number of some of the more premier uh, institutions in the country that have been targeted by these lawsuits, including NYU, MIT, Duke, Yale, Cornell, Columbia, Vanderbilt, Emory. Uh, there's a few others, including Nor Northwestern, USC, Johns Hopkins. So not uh, limited to one geographic area. Uh, these lawsuits have popped up across the country. Um, and you may ask, why these particular plans? Well, certainly uh, the prestige of these universities and, and the size of the schools may have been involved. If you read these complaints, the plans involved are often referred to as jumbo plans, uh, many of which have more than a billion dollars in assets in the plans. So these are, are targets for plaintiff's attorneys. Uh, that's not to say if you have a much smaller uh, plan that you shouldn't be worried about these issues, as we've seen with uh, similar 401k fee litigation over the years that started with some of the bigger plans. Um, those lawsuits have trickled down to smaller plans as well uh, in the range of 10 and 20 million dollars. So I think it's a concern for all colleges and universities uh, about what's going on in the environment right now, even if you don't have a billion dollars of assets in your plan. So what's happened in the last few weeks? Well, in total, 12 different colleges, as we just mentioned, were sued in approximately one week, a kind of an unprecedented wave of lawsuits hitting the higher education community. Eleven of the twelve sponsored 403B plans, uh, which as you may know are unique to tax exempt institutions and are a type of plan that's sponsored by many colleges and universities across the country and have their own unique history and unique attributes, uh, which may have in part led to some of the claims that are in these lawsuits that have been brought. Uh, the lawsuits are class actions that allege breach of ERISA fiduciary duties in selecting and monitoring the investment funds that are held under these plans and also the record keepers that are hired to, to run these plans. Um, so it's not uh, lawsuits brought by the government. Uh, class actions require participants in the plans uh, to sue uh, their employer. So that's who's bringing these cases. Um, and they're brought by a single Midwestern firm uh, by the name of Schlichter, Bogart, and Denton. Uh, this particular firm has a unique history in the area of fee litigation cases. It's one of the pioneering firms, I guess you could say, uh, that's been doing these cases for about 10 years. Uh, previously, uh, really, they focused on private institutions, private companies, and now they're moving into the higher education space and certainly college and universities are now firmly in their crosshairs. Hundreds of millions of dollars are alleged in these cases, so we're not talking about small dollar amounts. And the defendants are primarily the colleges themselves and the plan fiduciaries 
uh, of those plans uh, maintained by the colleges, which is typically a retirement plan committee and other individuals who, who operate those plans. So just a roadmap of what we'll cover today. Uh, we're going to start out with why these lawsuits are being brought now. Uh, we're going to move into some basic ERISA concepts uh, regarding fiduciary duties and prohibited transactions. Now I know that we do have some state institutions uh, in the audience today and as you may be aware um, as a governmental plan you are not subject to ERISA. Um, so some of the concepts may not be directly related to you in the, in the sense that there are ERISA laws but state trust and fiduciary laws will be applicable to your plans and they run pretty much parallel to the types of issues that we'll be talking about today. So even if you are maintaining a governmental plan, I think the uh, issues that we're going to discuss today are important to you as well. Uh, we'll move on to the special characteristics of 403B plans um, and also hit on the fee disclosure requirements, which are fairly new requirements over the past four years or so uh, to provide information to participants about what types of fees that they are paying in connection with their plan accounts and also information from the providers to us as employers about how much we're paying in connection with these arrangements. Um, then we'll detail the claims made in these higher ed lawsuits and then finish with some best practices for retirement plan fiduciaries. Okay, these higher ed lawsuits. Uh, you know, so why are our colleges, committees, and other fiduciaries at least allegedly liable for plan losses? You may be thinking that you know, as an institution, we are trying hard to provide a good retirement plan to our participants. Uh, we may be actually giving participants what they want, what they've requested. We may have input from faculty and other employees in connection with our retirement plan offering. Um, that may be true, but at the end of the day, um, the participants direct investments of their accounts from a fund roster that's chosen by the plan fiduciaries. And then most instances that may be a retirement plan committee that is making those decisions. That committee is a fiduciary and carrying out its fiduciary duties in connection with those uh, choices. So that is a fiduciary act, uh, selecting those funds that participants can choose from. Uh, one uh, legal issue that you may be aware of, may have heard before, is ERISA Section 404C, which gives you a little bit of a uh, reprieve from fiduciary duty with respect to the investment decisions that are made by our participants, um, as long as we offer a wide range of investments and allow participants to exercise control. We're not liable for the actual investment choices that those participants make. However, despite 404C, we still retain the fiduciary responsibility for selecting and monitoring those investments. So their investment choices aren't a fiduciary act by us, but we're responsible for selecting what investments might be in that uh, fund lineup at the end of the day. So why now? Why are these lawsuits coming around now? Well, they come on the, he the heels of a number of lawsuits alleging fiduciary breaches with respect to 401k plans uh, in the private sector and these lawsuits have been going on for about 10 years. So there's been a, a history here at least in the private sector with companies and corporations and now it, the, the shift is moving to higher education in the past few weeks. So if you see here our, our next slide, this uh, details at least some of the cases and, and settlements that have occurred over the past 10 years. Um, some of the, the numbers here uh, might be a little eye-opening to folks. Um, you know, we're talking settlements, uh, 57 million, 62 million, uh, so large amounts. And as you can see, some of these companies are uh, very large companies and well-respected companies, Boeing, Lockheed Martin. Uh, to name a few. Um, the majority of these cases have settled, um, so there hasn't been a lot of case law developed yet in this area, um, but there's been at least one case that, that's been decided that, that has developed some, some case law in this area. And Rob, do you have a... Yeah, th uh, this is Rob Patterson. So um, we're not going to uh, analyze many 
or any court decisions in detail uh, in this presentation, but we do want to at least mention Tussey versus ABB Inc. Uh, this is really the case that started this 10-year wave of 401k fee litigation that John just mentioned. Uh, 2010, the date you see on the screen is the date of a, an appeals court decision affirming an earlier decision. The, that earlier decision and the $37 million verdict was, was in 2006. So that was the first case uh, that started this, uh, this uh, trend of lawsuits. Um, and it's also, as far as I know, the only case of this type that went to a verdict in favor uh, of the plaintiffs. So the defendant fiduciaries have won a bunch, a bunch of cases, and there have been settlements, as you can see. Uh, but this is the one case that produced a plaintiff uh, uh, verdict. And it was brought by the same firm, the same Midwestern law firm that has brought these 12 higher education lawsuits. Um, ironically, that, that verdict was, was later overturned uh, uh, just last year, I believe, on kind of a procedural technicality. So, um, but still, uh, the, the original verdict really shook the retirement plan world back in 2006. And as John said, it's still uh, one of the few cases that has, uh, that really explores the pertinent issues. Thanks, Rob. Um, so why uh, so many retirement plan fee lawsuits Notorious bank robber Willie Sutton says that's where the money is. 4.5 trillion in U.S. retirement accounts as of 2014. Um, I've heard people refer to these types of lawsuits as the next wave of asbestos litigation, or, or similar to asbestos litigation as far as its reach. Um, and the damages can aggregate quickly. Um, we have an example here where we have a plan with 100 100 million in assets and pays just 20 basis points in excess fees. Um, and if you read some of these complaints, many times it's not much more, much less than 20 basis points where they're talking about the difference between two alternative funds and one being prudent and one not being prudent, at least as alleged in the complaints. Um, with the 20 basis points, we could end up with a $200,000 loss each year, a uh, million dollars over five years. So we're talking about significant amounts of money. Um, other breaches can produce even greater losses. Um, if you have an imprudent investment, for example, you, the loss will be based on the loss earnings associated with that imprudent investment versus something that would be more prudent for the circumstances. So the amounts can add up with respect to these cases and there, there's real money involved as we saw on the last slide with, with numerous settlements and the verdict in Tussie. There's also the fact that under ERISA, the winning party can get attorney's fees. And as you might imagine, those can add up very quickly in these types of cases as well. So these are all reasons for us to be concerned about these types of cases and at least have an understanding of where our risks lie uh, in maintaining these retirement plan uh, plans for our participants. So the next part of this uh, presentation, we're going to run through just a quick, a quick uh, outline of ERISA fiduciary responsibilities and ERISA basics regarding fiduciary responsibility, uh, just to give you an underpinning for the claims uh, that we're going to talk about later in the presentation that were brought in connection with these recent cases. So who are ERISA fiduciaries? Uh, this is straight from the uh, ERISA definition. Any person who exercises authority regarding the management or administration of a plan or exercise authority regarding plan assets or renders investment advice for a fee. Um, so when we're talking internally with our plan committees, those folks are definitely people who uh, have discretionary authority with respect to the plan management and administration of the plan and typically exercise authority regarding plan assets. Um, you might have an investment manager involved with your plan who uh, provides services for a fee. Uh, that individual also can be considered a, a fiduciary. Um, and we put the parenthetical there. There's some new rules. You may have heard the, the recent regulations in the last few months that are uh, set out to define who is a fiduciary for that purpose. So certainly, uh, fiduciary concepts and fiduciary issues are, are, are hot topics at this time in the law. The uh, fiduciary responsibilities, how do we determine? Well, it's really a functional test. Uh, a person is a fiduciary 
only to the extent that he or she performs a fiduciary function. So for example, you're not a fiduciary just because you have a title that may infer some involvement with respect to uh, plan investments or uh, you know, the other, other aspects of plan administration um, uh, that you have with your retirement plan. Um, yeah, and conversely, you can be a fiduciary if you're performing a fiduciary function, even if you don't have a fiduciary sounding title or you're not an officer, for example. Um, kind of, but, 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 but as John points out, you're, you're, you're only a fiduciary to the extent that, that what you're doing, or, or excuse me, only to the, with respect to breaches that occur in this realm of responsibility that you have. So it's not an all or nothing proposition. And for example, if you're a fiduciary for administrative matters, but not investment matters, then you should not be liable for a, a breach relating to uh, the plan's investments. Right. So it's really it's really a functional test and looks at what what functions you're performing with respect to that particular act. Uh, finally, fiduciaries are personally liable for breaches. This is somewhat of an eye opener to some. Um, many times, especially in the college and university space, you might have faculty members or other employees who are just uh, there to provide input related to investments. Um, if they're officially part of your committee um, and therefore a fiduciary, uh, they're considered to be personal liable for the decisions made by that fiduciary committee. So that goes along with something we'll talk about later on, the importance of fiduciary education, uh, understanding who should be part of your retirement plan committees, making sure those retirement plan committees know what their obligations are and what the potential risks are for serving on those committees. Uh, moving to uh, other risks of fiduciary duties, um, the duty of loyalty and the exclusive purpose rule, uh, this is a big one. Uh, certainly fiduciaries must act under the law solely in interest of participants and for the exclusive purpose of paying benefits and reasonable plan expenses. So we may have heard the concept of wearing two hats. Uh, often we're acting as college administrators uh, with the one hat looking out for the best interests of the college or university. Um, but when we're acting in a plan administration capacity, uh, we're acting in a fiduciary capacity where we have to act solely in the interest of plan participants and beneficiaries. And certainly when we're in the role of selecting investment options, uh, record keepers, that fiduciary hat is firmly on uh, at that point. And, and generally we can't act with uh, a dual purpose when we make those decisions and we can't administer the plan for the benefit of the college and the university as opposed to the benefit of uh, participants and beneficiaries. Um, well, John, this is Shelley Heffernan talking, but um, John cited a case there, and it makes a, a really good point. Uh, what you might say, how can you administer a plan for the benefit of the employer? Well, in the Grumman, in the Dunman Ben B. Beerworth is a case about uh, Grumman. Grumman uh, was subject to a takeover bid by LTV going back to the oh, mid 1980s. And uh, the executives, who were the trustees of the plan, thought they could use the plan assets to help thwart the takeover bid by buying a big chunk of Grumman stock in, for the plan itself. Well, that was a great idea from the point of view of the company, but it wasn't really using the plan assets for the exclusive purpose of benefiting of the plan participants. And uh, so that's a real bellwether case here that's cited often for having to use only the plan assets only for the benefit of participants, not for the company. Yeah. Thanks, Shelley. Yeah, I mean, that, that is one of these seminal cases. And, and although in the college and university space we might not have, you know, hostile takeovers, we certainly have situations where we may be having to address a situation where one decision might be more beneficial for the college uh, than choosing another, or another path that might be more beneficial for participants and beneficiaries. And we've got to remember that we have that fiduciary hat on and making decisions regarding the plan. Our, our sole interest has to be in, in interest of participants and beneficiaries. And some of these 
cases or complaints, or at least one of them, hit on some ideas of loyalty. I think it was the MIT complaint uh, where the Fidelity CEO uh, is someone who was sitting on the board of MIT. Fidelity was also uh, one of the record keepers with respect to that plan. Uh, Fidelity also made large contributions to MIT. So there was allegations, at least, made in that MIT complaint that uh, you know the, the, the loyalty was somehow compromised by this relationship with Fidelity. So something to keep in mind when you're making those decisions in connection with your fiduciary committees. Um, so what else do we have to do as fiduciaries? Uh, we have a duty to follow plan documents um, to the extent those documents and hopefully they are consistent with ERISA and other fiduciary duties. And we have to uh, a duty to diversify plan assets. Um, you know, this is generally found only where the other duties, such as prudence, were also violated. Um, it's only really found to be an issue in those circumstances. Finally, uh, and I think this is the big one, at least related to uh, the cases that we're going to talk about today, is the duty of prudence um, and the importance of practicing procedural prudence in connection with the decisions you make uh, in your retirement plan committees. Uh, that duty of prudence talks about the skill, care, and prudence of, and diligence of a prudent man familiar with such matters. And this is kind of the prudent expert rule. Uh, so it's not a lay person that we're really comparing it to. It's someone who's knowledgeable in the retirement plan matters uh, that are being talked about and decided upon in these committees. Harken back to, I did a series of uh, presentations with a DOL representative uh, who, who would comment on this duty of prudence always saying well if you don't if you're not an expert in this area and you don't have an expert then you need to hire an expert so there is a there is a heightened uh, expectation on the part of the DOL and ingrained in the law about who should be carrying out uh, these duties as fiduciaries uh, the importance of procedural prudence certainly conducting an investigation this may mean you know, different funds in your plan uh, retain an appropriate expert. We just talked about that a little. If you don't have the expertise, you might need to hire someone who does have that expertise. Consider alternatives. Um, this may be mean go out to get an RFP or uh, or other information regarding what other alternatives are out there for you as a plan sponsor. And you know, finally, part of procedural prudence is documenting your compliance. So you, because you might do the greatest job in the world, but if you don't have a record of that. Uh, that could create an issue if you ever have a, a complaint or, or lawsuit filed against you. So that's the background on our fiduciary responsibilities. We're trying to kind of lay the framework for, for the cases that we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, before that, though, I'm going to pass it off to Shelly, and she's going to talk a little bit about the history of 403Bs and that how that history may have contributed to some of the unique aspects that are part of these claims that we're going to talk about today. Thank you, John. Um, just go backwards a little bit. I think um, John's last slide is probably the most important one in our presentation. And don't worry if you didn't copy it down because we will send you a copy of these PowerPoints after the uh, presentation's over. But uh, following John's uh, last slide, if fiduciaries do focus on their duty to act prudently, and follow, if they follow prudent procedures and they document what they do, they can save themselves a lot of trouble in the long run. So, as John said, I'm going to talk a bit about the history of 403B plans. As John noted, all but one of the plans hit by this recent tidal wave of cases are 403B plans. And I'm going to address what makes 403B plans different from the 401k plans that were the targets of the first wave of retirement plan fee litigation. Some of the difficulties that are faced by fiduciaries of 403b plans now are attributable to the historical differences between 403b and 401k plans. Now 403b plans go back a lot farther than 401k um, to 1958, so that was long before 401k plans allowed individual participants to make tax-deferred contributions. So uh, back in 1958, the code was amended to allow 
uh, only employees of tax exempt organizations to make tax deferred contributions to these plans. And they were viewed as personal supplemental pension vehicles for not for profits. For the most part, the contributions were voluntary contributions made by participants, although there certainly were um, contributions made by the uh, employers themselves. And the code limited the type of investments that could be made. They called for contributions to be invested only in annuity contracts. These were often individual contracts, although sometimes they were group contracts, and as time went on, there were more group contracts. It was not uncommon for employers to allow their employees to select their own annuity contract vendor, or the employers might provide a selection of insurance companies from which the employees could choose. So the traditional 403B plan was structured with a menu of uh, there were multiple annuity contract investment options. The annuity contracts themselves typically made it difficult for the employer to take action to move funds from one in insurance company to another. Um, participant consent was typically needed, uh, even in the case of a group annuity contract. In addition, uh, the annuity contracts typically offered the full platform of investment funds that the uh, particular insurance company offered. So um, employers didn't have the opportunity to select among the funds, and employees themselves got used to having a broad choice of investment funds available. It wasn't um, until 1974 when ERISA came along that the code was amended to allow mutual funds as a 403B plan investment. Mutual funds, of course, are much more flexible than annuity contracts and give the employer much more um, ability to control what's offered and, and change from one provider to another. Uh, the 403B world changed dramatically in 2007 when the IRS issued regulations that treated 403B plans much more like 401K plans. The new requirements took effect in 2009 and they included the requirement of a written plan document. It obliged employers to monitor and enforce various internal revenue code limits on the amounts of contributions, the way loans were administered, the way distributions were made, and there is also now a new imposition for 5500s where much, full, much more information needed to be given on 5500s for 403B plans. And the audit requirement um, that applied to other kinds of plans was imposed on 403B plans as well. So it needed a lot more coordination between the investment vendors and the employers. In many cases, these new regulations led employers to review and overhaul their 403B investments, and they ended up narrowing the choices of investment providers that were available under their plans. But still, there remained legacy annuity contracts with their full complement of investment fund choices. Employers were often loath to eliminate some of the vendors, even prospectively, prospectively, because um, of their fear of negative reaction from their employees. So oftentimes employers felt stuck with the vendors they already had in place. The next um, legal development that impacted the administration of 403B plans was the issuance by the Department of Labor new rules requiring extensive disclosure of the fees and expenses paid by retirement plans. These regulations took effect in 2012, and they had there were two aspects to them. The first, uh, 404A regs, required plan fiduciaries to provide information to the participants. There was annual and quarterly disclosure required of a lot of information about the 
investments that were offered under the plans. Um, it required historical investment returns for each uh, investment fund under the plan. The benchmarks that were, were used uh, to uh, determine how well the funds were doing, the funds expense ratios, and also um, the information was needed about the administrative expenses imposed on individual participants' accounts. The idea of the Department of Labor was to give participants uh, enough information so that they could make informed investment choices. Um, the second set of regulations uh, went in a different direction. Under ERISA 408b2, these regulations required the plan service providers to provide information to the plan fiduciary, which would generally be the employer. And the service provider was supposed to, and is supposed to, um, inform the employer of whether or not the, the service provider views himself as a fiduciary, um, needs to explain the services provided, and also reveal all the sources of confirmation, uh, all the sources of compensation. Um, this includes both direct compensation from the plan and indirect compensation such as revenue sharing from the separate investment funds um, that's paid over to the service provider. The purpose of this requirement is to give plan fiduciaries the information they need to evaluate whether the fees being charged to the plan are reasonable. Now, fiduciaries have to do this to determine whether or not it's reasonable to retain uh, an investment fund in the plan because one of the fiduciary's duty is to make sure that the fund, that the fees paid by the plan are reasonable, and if they use uh, the plan assets to pay fees that are not reasonable, it's uh, a prohibited transaction on the part of the fiduciary, which, um, as John mentioned, can lead to personal liability on the part of the fiduciary himself. So I'm now going to turn this over to Rob Patterson, who's going to address uh, some of the charges that are made in the lawsuits that have been filed against colleges and universities. Uh, thanks, Shelley. So Shelley and John have uh, kind of uh, set the background of, uh, of these 12 cases. Uh, they've explained what fiduciary duties are involved, or the breach of which are involved in these cases. And uh, Shelley's explained some of the unique characteristics of 403B plans and why the uh, kind of the migration of the claims that have been made for 10 years against 401K plans have now, you know, moved over to the, to the world of 403B plans in higher education. Uh, so, so, so John mentioned that 11 of the 12 cases that have been brought in the last couple of weeks involve 403B plans, and the claims made in those 11 suits um, are very similar. <clears throat> Um, really, there are three principal claims made in all 11 of those cases. Um, all of those plans are large, uh, a billion or close to a billion or even more in assets. The plaintiffs call these jumbo plans, and the plaintiffs claim that these large plans have tremendous leverage in, uh, in uh, negotiating for record-keeping and administrative services. Uh, these services require fees that are paid by the plan, and that's where the plaintiff's damages are alleged to lie. Specifically, the principal claim in these 11 403B lawsuits is that the plans squandered this leverage that they have as a result of their size by maintaining a large number of investment fund options. Duke, for example, uh, is alleged to have over 400 funds uh, and four record keepers. Cornell, 300 funds in each of two different plans. Um, the plaintiffs say that this dispersal of the aggregate plan assets among many different funds and record keepers caused the plans to, to lose their leverage, to lose their ability to exploit their bargaining power, and this resulted in higher fees and expenses being paid by the plan. And this, it's claimed, reduced the plaintiff participants' uh, retirement account balances. Um, the plaintiffs also claim that the large number of funds was confusing to participants, uh, a, a phenomenon that's sometimes called choice overload. That you know, you can imagine trying to select your your uh, your retirement plan investments from among 400 choices. 
So unnecessarily high fees caused by too many separate funds really represent the damages that the plaintiffs are claiming in these cases. Uh, the fees uh, that we're talking about in these cases, these include you know, revenue sharing fees, uh, so-called 12B1 fees, sales charges, and other things that investment charge, uh, excuse me, that investment funds generally deduct from the return that ultimately inures to the benefit of the retirement accounts. Um, second, the complaints also claim that even with all of these you know, dozens or hundreds of options, the plans fail to offer lower cost alternatives to the funds that were offered. Uh, specifically, the complaints say that all the plans were large enough to enable them to offer so-called institutional class shares rather than retail shares. Uh, in general, retail shares are available to anyone in the public, um, whereas institutional share prices um, are in theory negotiated by the purchaser, by, and, and, and only large purchasers can qualify for that uh, for that purchase. So the the claim here, and this the second claim, is that the plan fiduciaries didn't take advantage of their size to offer lower cost shares uh, that offered the same investment characteristics as the retail shares that they did offer. And lastly, the third claim that's made in all eleven of these suits is that the fiduciaries, the plan fiduciaries, continued to offer certain specific funds. Uh, a TIAA craft stock fund and a real estate fund, um, even after these two funds had underperformed for years, and even though they carried significantly higher revenue sharing fees than other similar equities. So let's, I'm going to look at in a little more detail at each of these three uh, basic claims. So the first one, and, and, and perhaps the most important one, is, is again that the fiduciaries caused the plan to pay excessive fees by maintaining too many funds and multiple record keepers. Um, if, you know, at this point, we have only the allegations and the complaint to go to go on, and we haven't heard the defendant's um, response. But this claim that the fiduciaries, in effect, didn't pay attention to fees, uh, and therefore breached their ERISA duty. This, this claim is at the heart of most of the 401k cases that John Godso mentioned at the, at the start of this presentation, including that seminal Tussey case. Um, and it's worth mentioning that since, this wave, since the wave of 401k fee litigation began in 2006, uh, planned fees have in fact gone down substantially. According to one survey, uh, total fees have gone down from about 1.03% of assets to about 0.95%, so that's almost 8% uh, of the total fees. So sit, once fiduciaries started, you know, once their attention was gotten with all these uh, fee litigation, um, it, it seems that, that they were able to negotiate lower fees or, or the investment funds started charging lower fees. Uh, in, this, in, in the, in the, in the Tussey case, uh, the one that went to a verdict in favor of the plaintiffs and against the fiduciaries, the court found that the, the fiduciaries had not even calculated the revenue sharing and other fees that the plan was paying. So that, you know, they didn't, not only, you know, they, they couldn't claim that they had, 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 had tried to keep fees down because they hadn't even looked at what the fees were. And this lack of attention to the issue was central to the courts holding that they had breached their, their ERISA duty. Uh, planned fiduciaries don't necessarily have to pick the funds with the lowest fees. Um, if they did, you know, that would be an easy thing to, to do. But they do have to show that they considered fees in relation to the services for which the fee was paid. And this principle applies to investment services and all other planned services, including record keeping. Um, and fiduciaries have to exercise what is called procedural prudence. Uh, Shelley mentioned this uh, a little earlier. So that means that they have to have a process for weighing the advantages and disadvantages of competing funds. They have to follow that process, and they have to be able to document that they went through this process prudently. Uh, the, the, the biggest lesson from this presentation, I think, is that procedural prudence is the best defense to an ERISA claim uh, of the type that's being made in these higher ed cases. Um, in terms of the range of funds and this claim that, that there were too many funds offered, now under, under ERISA 404C, which John mentioned earlier, this is the provision of ERISA that governs participant-directed investments. Um, you do have to have a range of funds that participants can choose from, um, but you know that range almost certainly doesn't go up to 300 or 400, as was alleged in these cases. So this, this concept of choice overload is probably relevant here. There were too many funds. Um, it was confusing to participants, and it resulted in excessive fees, or at least that's what the plaintiffs claim. 
The second big claim made in these 11 suits is that the, the, the higher ed fiduciaries failed to offer or even consider lower cost alternatives, especially lower cost institutional class shares um, rather than retail shares. Um, again, we're not going to discuss a lot of uh, court decisions, but I'll, I'll just mention one other one, and that is Tibble versus Edison. This is a famous case in my practice area because it went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court just last year, uh, kind of on a procedural issue. But in an earlier stage of that litigation, the plaintiffs made a similar claim that the fiduciaries didn't consider or offer institutional class shares, and that claim was upheld. That was held to be a breach of duty uh, on the part of the plan fiduciaries. Um, again, there's no hard rule that a plan, when it reaches a certain size and therefore qualifies for uh, institutional class shares, has to do so. Uh, but at minimum, the fiduciaries have to consider such a change, um, and, you know, in, in relation to the risks uh, and returns involved. You know, institutional class shares have somewhat fewer investor protections, so it may not be, you know, a slam dunk to offer them as soon as the plan qualifies. Uh, but again, the fiduciaries have to analyze this choice and exercise procedural prudence. It's possible that the fiduciaries in these cases, or some of these cases, didn't do that. They didn't pay attention to the fact that the plans were growing in size uh, and therefore qualified for these for this other type of investment. And lastly, the third claim made in these cases is that the, is that the fiduciaries continued to offer certain uh, specific funds, again, a TIA craft stock fund and a TIA craft real estate fund, even after they had um, underperformed for years. Um, and even though they, they, they carried significantly higher revenue sharing and other um, uh, fees than, than, than similar investments. Um, specifically, the complaint says that these two funds uh, underperformed published benchmarks for years um, and that the fiduciaries, therefore, should have dropped them from the roster of available uh, investment funds. So. Um, I think the, the, the complaint mentions that TIA Craft, in effect, was requiring that these funds be offered as part of its roster of funds. But uh, again, fiduciaries have a duty to not only exercise prudence in initially selecting funds, they also have to monitor them, monitor their performance and make adjustments and changes when needed. Um, and the claim is that they, they, they didn't do this and that they should have dropped these funds in favor of, of, of uh, other alternatives. So that's, those are the three major claims made in the 11 lawsuits that involve 403B plans. The oddball of the, of the group of 12 is the MIT complaint. MIT maintained a, a 401K plan rather than a 403B plan. And rather than, uh, it, it is claimed that they had, um, you know, a large number of duplicative funds. So this choice overload concept is relevant also. But they did not have multiple record keepers. They, they depended solely on fidelity. And the claim is that uh, MIT selected Fidelity because it had a relationship with Fidelity outside of the plan, unrelated to the plan. Uh, a Fidelity executive sat on the board of MIT. Uh, I believe Fidelity contributed to their endowment. Um, and, and the claim is that um, the fiduciaries did not act solely in the best interest of participants in selecting Fidelity as their principal uh, investment provider and record keeper. Um, again, uh, uh, Shelley, I believe, or Shelley or John, or both of them mentioned earlier this duty of loyalty. On top, in, in addition to the duty of prudence, you have to act only in the interest of plan participants. And the claim here is that the, the MIT uh, fiduciaries did not do that. Um, the the, the Tussie case that I mentioned a couple times involved a similar claim where uh, where where fees paid by the plan were in effect subsidizing other services that. Uh, the investment fund was providing to the uh, sponsor, corporate payroll and other services. Um, you know, if true, those would support a claim of fiduciary breach in the form of a, a breach of the duty of loyalty. Um, all, one other uh, unique wrinkle in the MIT complaint is that the, um, I, I mentioned that they also were alleged to have, you know, too many funds, uh, hundreds of funds um, and which was confusing to participants. 
they changed last year in 2015 and went down to a more uh, manageable 15 funds, I believe. And in announcing that change, they came kind of close to admitting that the previous arrangement was imprudent. They said, we're making this change so we'll be better able to reduce the fees. What the complaint says is that, um, you know, this is tantamount to an admission that the previous arrangement was imprudent and that the fees, you know, during that past time period were, were too high. So those are the claims made in the, um, uh, the 11 403B suits and the, and the, and the MIT, uh, and the MIT suit, obviously we'll have to wait to see what happens uh, once defendants have, a, have uh, a chance to respond. But at this point, we, we want to discuss, you know, what can uh, retirement plan fiduciaries do to avoid these kind of claims and to uh, defend them if they arise. So what, um, this is Shelley Heffernan again, and if we consider uh, the claims that were made in the lawsuits that Rob Patterson just discussed, we can see a pattern, and um, the flip side of that pattern can demonstrate what some of the best practices are in selecting investment funds for a plan. Um, for example, Rob talked about the use of revenue sharing to pay administrative fees. Uh, not unusual, but it, doing that it is difficult to figure out, you know, exactly what people are being paid. Fees that are paid for administration, such as record keeping, uh, need to be negotiated and then uh, to determine whether or not they're reasonable. Uh, even if they are reasonable, the question is who's paying for it? If the fees are all paid from revenue sharing, some participant, the funds selected by some of the participants may have larger re revenue sharing than others, and those participants end up paying a larger percentage of the plan's overall fees. So this is something that the plan fiduciary has to be aware of and has to analyze. Um, another point in those cases, um, charge that excessive fees and expenses were being charged to the uh, plan. The fiduciary's obligation is to determine what the fees are, compare those fees, um, benchmark them, people say, benchmark the fees, see what other plans of similar size pay, and determine whether or not the fees are reasonable. Um, another point was retail funds versus institution, institutional class shares. Um, institutional class shares aren't always available, but the fiduciary has to find out where the, they are. And um, if it's not using institutional class shares, it needs to have a really good reason why they're not. Um, another point brought up in the cases was the use of managed funds rather than index funds. Certainly, investment theories can differ, and some advisors would um, think the allegations made in, in the complaints are really preposterous that managed funds can't perform as well as or better than index funds. But this is something that the fiduciary has to consider, has to come to a reasoned decision on, and has to document. Um, another point. Uh, the selection of funds with low returns. Um, now that seems really an odd thing that somebody would actually select a fund with low returns, but uh, fiduciary ob obviously has to look at historic returns on a fund, has to be able to uh, pick a fund because of investment style, because of managers, has to look through all the things that would go into making a fund successful versus um, unsuccessful. You cannot predict the future, but you have to pick a fund based on all the information available. So uh, by looking at what's being alleged in these cases, we can see what a fiduciary has to do to avoid the charges that um, are being made against those particular plans. So uh, obviously a lot of this discussion is focused on the reasonableness of fees and expenses. Why are we talking about it so much? Well, we're talking about it because 
the analysis is important in two ways. First of all, the duty of plan fiduciaries is to administer the plan, as John told us, for the exclusive benefit of participants. Charging fees to the plan that are not reasonable is certainly not for the benefit of participants. And secondly, causing the plan to pay excessive fees is a prohibited transaction and it's a fiduciary breach. The Department of Labor has been focusing this on this for years, long before the fee litigation started in 2006. Um, they and the Department of Labor has had an example. It's used again and again in all its publications, um, including a publication they put out for plan participants to look at to determine um, how to select investments. So this example is at the bottom of uh, the slide here, and it actually is based on uh, a participant who's got twenty-five thousand dollars in his account when he's age 30 and has uh, another 35 years to work. And the department says, well, if this guy was earning 7% a year on his investment, after 35 years, he would have $227,000 in his account if the overall fee ratio was 1.5% versus the possibility of having now, I take that back, 1% versus $163,000 if the fee ratio was 1.5%. So the difference is um, a, a significant difference, 28% uh, over 35 years in the account. So this is the kind of example the Department of Labor has made up for participants, and it's something that um, plan fiduciaries should be cognizant of as well. So I'd like to go back to why I said John Godzo's slide number 12 was the most important one we have, because prudent procedure is key to avoiding trouble. So let's just go through again what prudent procedure requires. It requires the fiduciary to analyze each fund with respect to the risks, the returns, and the costs, and analyze the entire portfolio with the same things in mind as well as looking at whether or not there are overlaps in funds that should be uh, uh, avoided. Then the next point is to follow the terms of the plan and the plan's investment policy, retain advisors if needed, and then continue to monitor a fund once it's selected. Um, this is, uh, Rob Patterson mentioned the case of uh, the Tibble case that where the Supreme Court found that uh, there could be a continuing violation if a, if a fund is, it might be a good fund and initially selected, but if it's not monitored on a regular basis and turns out to fail to meet the standards that it should be meeting, that's a continuing violation of the uh, fiduciary's duty. And lastly, I'd like to repeat that this whole procedure should be documented. If the fiduciary can show that it did consider and analyze the data and came to a reasonable conclusion, the fiduciary can protect himself from liability even though somebody might challenge whether or not that was a good decision to have been made. The process itself is very important. So um, I'd like to go back to Rob now who has some further guidance for us on how to act prudently. So here you are, Rob. Uh, hi, this is Rob Patterson. So we're, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to move quickly through the last few screens. There, were, there was a, uh, excuse me, the, the, the DOL, the Department of Labor's most recent guidance that's relevant to, to what you, your committees and fiduciaries should be doing, uh, came out last year. Specifically, this, this guidance was on selecting an annuity, but really it had, the advice in it is is, is uh, pertinent to any fiduciary decision, I believe. And again, it's, it's again repeating uh, some of the procedural prudence steps uh, that Shelley and John have described. So what this, this guidance uh, says is that fiduciaries have to ga engage in an objective and thorough, thorough analysis of choices. So again, follow a pre-established, you know, have a, have a procedure for, for analyzing investments or other contracts, follow that procedure, document uh, 
how it, you know, how the decision was reached and what the decision is. Uh, avoid self-dealing. Remember the duty of loyalty. Uh, so you have to have a procedure to ferret out any conflicts of interest. If you're considering a Vanguard fund and you have a committee member who works for, you know, who has some relationship with Vanguard, that has to be addressed. Um, consider the risk and returns of the investment versus the alternatives. Benchmarking is something that's, a, that, you know, it's a critical component of this kind of um, uh, procedure. Um, costs, it's, again, it's not simply a matter of picking the lowest cost option. You have to look at the costs and compare it to the services provided and, again, show that you made that analysis. Uh, ensure that investments are diversified. There, there is also this ERISA duty of diversification and it's a specific requirement of, of Section 404C. Um, and remember again that it, that the standard is the so-called prudent expert standard. You know, there was a there was a, a, a famous statement by a court in one of these cases that said a pure heart and an empty head is not good enough. You know, you can't say, you know, I did the best I could on the investment committee, but what, I don't know anything about investments. If you don't have the expertise yourself, you have to uh, consult uh, appropriate experts. Um, so, again, the, the, the Department of Labor has been looking at these issues for, you know, almost 15 years. Um, this is the most recent guidance. It's about three or four pages long, and I think it's worth reading in its entirety. We'd be glad to send it to you um, if you'd like. A few other issues that have come up in, in there, these, these issues, um, some of these issues are not necessarily in the, the new uh, higher ed cases, but they're in a lot of the 401k cases. Float, you know, your investment fund can earn money on contributions going into the plan and, and distributions going out of the plan, you know, kind of overnight. That is something that fiduciaries have to look at and make sure it's 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 addressed in um, the plan documents or the investment policy statement and that you've considered it as part of the investment funds total compensation um, revenue sharing again the payment of administrative fees with revenue sharing is not per se wrong but fiduciaries do have a duty to look at the amount of the fees paid uh, again in comparison to the services that are being provided and, and ensure that it's reasonable uh, and again, this claim that is made in the 403B cases, when the plan reaches a certain size and qualifies for institutional funds, the fiduciaries have to look at that. They have to at least consider it. They don't have to automatically make that change, but they have to uh, consider the advantages, advantages and disadvantages of institutional funds uh, and show that they analyze that. Lastly, or second lastly, fiduciary governance is a big part of procedural prudence and a big part of what fiduciaries have to do. Uh, and this is something that we work with our clients a lot on. So consider, con consider in all of this the, the, the governance uh, of the committees and other bodies that perform fiduciary functions. You know, committees, should there be a separate investment in administrative committees? I, I think that works well a lot of times, but it, you know, every case is different. Who should be on the committee? Again, you, you want to try to have experts. Uh, on those committees, if possible, uh, how you know what is the relationship to the governing board of the institution, the plan sponsor, and management? Uh, charters are a good idea. A charter that details the specific uh, responsibilities, um, of, 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 you know, of each fiduciary committee, how members are appointed, how long they serve, things like that. Um, pay attention to, to plan to the payment of plan expenses and the procedures for that. Um, and investment policy statement. This is the investment policy statement is you know a, a document that explains the general investment philosophy of the plan. It's arguably required by ERISA. Um, there, it's, there's kind of an art to drafting these things correctly. That's another thing that that plan fiduciaries should pay attention to. Lastly, I just want to uh, point out one kind of unique aspect of the the uh, these higher education cases. Again, the claim seems to be that they most of the plans had too many funds, uh, several of them in the 300 to 400 range. Now we we were able to find the uh, summary plan description, the SPD for the for the Duke University plan, and it talks about having three tiers of funds available uh, to participants. There was a, the first tier was included a target date fund, then there was a second tier of what they call core funds, which is really kind of the, what the committee determined was, was were best in class funds. And then the third tier were kind of all other funds, and this, the SPD says 
you, the participant, will, will be responsible for monitoring these, these funds in the third tier. So it looks a little like it might, this is some speculation somewhat, but it looks like maybe what Duke was doing was, was having something that was like a, a so-called brokerage window or a self-directed brokerage option where you tell, and some 401k, 401k plans do this as well, you simply tell participants, if you want to pick your own investments and not rely on us, the fiduciaries, you go ahead and you can, you can um, select any, really any investment you want. Um, the Department of Labor is struggling with how these fit under the fiduciary duty rules. Uh, they sent out a, a request for information, which means, you know, they're kind of polling the industry uh, a couple of years ago, and they're, they're, you know, probably looking to come up with some guidance on how these brokerage windows fit into ERISA fiduciary duty rules. So it's possible we may see when we, when we, we see the defenses to these complaints um, that uh, the defendants will say that that's really what, that's really why we had 400 funds, because most of them were simply uh, funds that were available kind of at the discretion of the participant, and maybe they will argue that, that different fiduciary duties will apply. But certainly the conservative approach would be to treat all funds that a participant can access as if they were in the plan, and therefore the fiduciaries are, have, have responsibility for them. Thanks, Rob. Uh, we do have some questions that, that came in today, um, and we'll... We'll try to address those now. I, the, the first question that uh, came up was, uh, what does good documentation look like for procedural uh, prudence? And I'll jump in here and, and the rest of the panel can, can talk as well here. I think as far as documentation, some of the things that we address in the presentation as far as having a committee charter having a investment policy statement, uh, having good minutes with respect to the community meetings that you have. Um, if you've gone through an RFP process, uh, have that documented as far as uh, who the different vendors you went out to and why you decided uh, one vendor over another. So I think that would be part of the documentation that, that would be looked for or would be asked for, certainly in connection with these lawsuits. And even if you're an audited by the DOL, some of the things that they might be looking at. Is there any other things that we can think of here? No, no, I think you covered it. And I think it's, again, documentation is a key part of procedural prudence. You, you, you want to be able to show that you went through a proper process. Right. Absolutely. You want to be able to show that. And I think I said earlier, you know, you could do all the uh, great actions in the world, but unless those are documented, uh, you, know, you won't have the ability to prove that you went through that process. Uh, we have a second question about uh, an employer with a 403B committee and you work with a third party consultant, which is common in retirement plan, plan committee contexts. Um, and, the question goes on to say that you understand your basic fiduciary responsibilities to plan, but would like to know if there are specific steps you should be taking, uh, knowing that these plans are being closely scrutinized and lawsuits are being filed in order to be better evaluate your risk uh, about being sued by plan participants. I mean, I, I would say that as far as looking back and, and trying to understand your risk, it's really going back, I think, in part of understanding, have, have you gone through this procedural prudence that we've mentioned a number of times? Um, have you compared your investment options? Uh, you know, when's the last time you took the plan out for an RFP? What's your documentation regarding those decisions? I, I think that that's a, a starting point for understanding your potential risk. Um, certainly, other risk fast factors are, you know, what's the size of your plan? Um, you know, there's a bunch of things that may go into whether you're going to get sued at the end of the day. But if you're trying to understand whether you've done the right thing or not, um, and whether there are potential holes in, in your process, I think it's going back and looking at um, what process you have undertaken and, and have you documented that well? And are, are you able to substantiate the decisions you made with respect to the uh, plan investments that are in your lineup now. Um, another question about TI-CREF, uh, specifically talking about uh, the fact that TI-CREF has been requiring many plans to keep their stock fund as a condition of keeping the traditional annuity. 
Um, and you know, also noting uh, anecdotally that many people choose that annuity. Um, are there any uh, thoughts on our part about how to address that? Uh, I would say one thing. I, I think in the complaints, that the, what the plaintiffs' attorneys would say is that regardless of uh, the fact that TI CREF is requiring you to do that, um, you have to evaluate whether that's prudent to to keep it in your your fund. So if, if TI CREF is requiring you to keep that fund in there, and you say, well, I, I don't think that that's a, a prudent investment decision, then you might have to look at another vendor, I, I, I would think, as far as what your options are. Yeah, uh, the question also notes that that contrary to what plaintiffs say, many people chose that traditional annuity. That That's true, and the complaint actually does mention that. It mentions that, that you know, not only uh, is the stock fund and the real estate fund underperforming, but it also attracted a lot of it. Uh, contributions. Um, so so I, I agree with what John said. Um, I think it's a little suspicious when a fund is required as a condition to getting some second fund. I suspect that the contract itself says that there's an out if, if the fiduciaries think that it's, you know, inconsistent with ERISA. But um, I, I, I do think that, that uh, fiduciaries would have, to, would have to look at that and look at whether they can re renegotiate that condition. Um, and 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 maybe even you know change change vendors. I wouldn't be surprised if TIA Cref has some different policy after all this. But it was interesting in the Duke case that you were talking about, Rob, that that um, Cref stock fund was in the third tier, the tier that they said we do not monitor. So putting the employee at um, his own risk for choosing it. Yeah, good point. Right. Right. Um, the questioner goes on to ask about, the, or mentions the fact that a lot of litigation here is an attack on TIA CREF. Uh, should we expect TIA CREF to weigh in on any of this? I mean, certainly TIA CREF is the, the major, I think, player in the college and university uh, sphere, so it's not surprising that these allegations relate to TIA CREF investments. Um, I, Shelley mentioned, I think that there will be a response to this, um, these lawsuits. I think Rob mentioned in part that we've seen in the corporate world some reduction in fees and some changes as a result of both probably the governmental regulations about the fee disclosures and these lawsuits that have been putting pressure on uh, companies to reduce fees. I think in general we've seen a trend toward a reduction in fees. Um, so I, I would expect Tia Kraft to, to respond in, in some manner uh, in connection with, with these lawsuits because certainly they are they are front and center in these complaints. Uh, another question is an annual frequency of monitoring funds and mo making choices based on performance sufficient. I, I don't know that there's ever been any case law or decision about how how often or how frequent you should do a meeting or decision making for prudence. Um, I'm not sure annual. I know a lot of meetings are on a biannual or quarterly basis. Annual might be stretching it a little bit, but uh, I don't know if I have experience either way on that. I would always recommend that the committees meet at least quarterly to review these. You don't have to go through the whole full-scale review of fund performance every time, but I think you want to document that you have look at it on a periodic basis as well. Yeah, totally agree. Um, there's another question about a uh, suggestion that there's a problem with using revenue sharing to pay administrative fees, knowing that some uh, plans pay more. Uh, and and the, the questioner notes that, that all plans work that way, and why is it problematic? Um, I, I don't think it's problematic per se. I know in the initial 401k fees, there was a lot of fee litigation, there was a lot of focus on revenue sharing uh, arrangements, and I don't think it was ever alleged that those are per se a, a violation of fiduciary uh, obligations, but that those fee arrangements had to be reasonable, I think, at the end of the day, was were yeah. what those allegations were. That's right. In fact, there are uh, a couple courts that in the 401k cases have, have stated flatly, it's not a per se breach to use revenue sharing to pay uh, administrative fees. And I think the questioner might have been 
pointing to me, <laughs> and, if I, and if I implied that that was wrong, then I, then I misspoke. It's not per se wrong, but the fiduciaries do have to look at the amount of the fees in relation to the services provided. I think those record-keeping fees in some of the cases um, were paid from revenue sharing, and it ended up being a lot more per person than probably could have been negotiated if the fee were negotiated separately from the revenue sharing. I mean, because revenue sharing can throw off more money um, to the service provider than probably the fiduciary would have negotiated had they actually negotiated the fee. And there's ways to recapture the excess revenue sharing and put it back into the plan as instead of just having a service provider pocket all the extra money beyond what would be a reasonable fee. Yeah, that's a good point. If your plan reaches a certain size and there isn't an arrangement under which revenue sharing gets credited in part back to the plan, then you should probably investigate that. I think that's the uh, end of our questions. Uh, we do appreciate uh, your participation today. We certainly enjoyed uh, doing this presentation and keeping you up to date on uh, these issues. And certainly, we'll continue to monitor the developments and provide additional information in the future. And obviously, we can provide a whole host of services related to fiduciary um, compliance with respect to retirement plans and feel free to reach out to Rob, Shelley, or myself if you need any assistance with those issues.